Hey, everybody. Thank you. And uh, I want to welcome everybody here to the McCluskey Lecture Series, but also to our listening audience, as they say, on Aspen Public Radio and Grassroots TV. Uh, Zeke Emanuel has had a nice, long, wonderful relationship with the Aspen Institute, for which I thank him. All of you know that probably that Zeke is a medical doctor, a breast oncologist, right? Somebody who's been a great cancer specialist. For many years has been at the National Institutes of Health as the head of the bioethics department there at the Clinical Center of NIH, which basically puts them at the intersection of medicine and morality, which is going to be something so important in the 21st century. So, uh, also, he's been secundered or pulled away or uh, assigned to the White House, the Office of Management and Budget, and Peter Orzag to be the policy director for health care and health care reform. So I can't imagine anybody who's got more important jobs than the ones I've just described. He uh, completed his uh, college degree at Amherst and then I think got four, five, six, seven, eight degrees from Oxford. I can't remember how many, but I think he just stayed at Oxford until the Emanuel family, which was having trouble with its children getting jobs, finally <laughs> called him home from Oxford and said, get a job. He developed the medical directive, which is a comprehensive living will that I hope some of you will ask him about. Uh, he's a uh, book on medical ethics, which is the ends of human life. What's the name of the um, health care reform book that I read last year? It's, I'm sure it's here, but health care guaranteed, which is uh, helping shape the way we think it. He's uh, gotten so many awards, I'm not going to read them to you because you'd rather hear from him. He served on uh, Bill Clinton's Health Care Task Force, the National Bioethics Advisory Commission. Uh, and uh, speaking of UCLA, I'm glad we have the director of the hospital there. He has uh, been a visiting professor at UCLA, Johns Hopkins, and the Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He's also been a lecturer at the Socrates Program, the Society of Fellows Program, and now the McCloskey Speaker Center, our friend Zeke Emanuel. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, maybe you guys don't know, but it's really nice outside. And uh, um, So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and a great honor to be part of this lecture series. And I always thoroughly enjoy coming to the Aspen Institute uh, in large measure because I get great questions and uh, have an opportunity to elaborate. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, we decided to use slides for this uh, presentation because there's a lot of biology here that I want people to understand uh, because you can't really understand the ethical issues unless you understand uh, some of the key biology. And so for some of you, this will be refreshing. For many of you, high school biology was the last course you took, and if you're like me, it had none of this uh, in it. Um, so this is about uh, human development. Uh, and uh, for those of you who uh, remember, those of you who don't, uh, we can start down at the bottom here. Uh, that's where the ovary squirts out an egg uh, called an oocyte, if I can, right here. And then you can uh, see uh, day zero there, that little thing inside. Yes, the male part is very, very small compared to the female part, and that continues for life. Um, <laughs> That's fertilization. <laughs> My three daughters remind me of that all the time. Uh, and a fertilized egg uh, uh, is made and then travels through the fallopian tube uh, towards the uh, uterus. And you can see over the course of time here, uh, by day two, it's in the two cell stage, uh, the four cell stage, then the eight cell uh, uncompacted morula. And I just want you to keep in mind that you know, by day four, you've got eight cells there. That'll be something we'll come back to at the end. Uh, by day five, uh, you've got this little uh, blastocele here, and that's key to the development of uh, stem cells. Um, and then you can see, uh, where is it on this screen? Down here, round about day nine uh, uh, or so, uh, implantation into the uterine uh, wall. So by... Uh, Nine days, uh, you go from uh, fertilization to implantation. Uh, now, there are two kinds of stem cells, and it's very important in this discussion to be very careful and precise. 
One kind are not embryonic. They're not derived from embryos. They're somatic or adult stem cells. They're, uh, if you do a bone marrow uh, biopsy, so you stick a, a, a syringe into the bone marrow in the back uh, of your uh, hip, uh, you pull out a bunch of cells, and there are going to be stem cells in there. Um, and then there's what we call induced pluripotent stem cells, and I'll explain this in a second. And the second flavor is uh, embryonic uh, stem cells. That's derived from human embryos. Now, these somatic stem cells, um, uh, there are a variety of types. There are fetal. There are ones that you can get from the umbilical cord blood. Uh, and then there are ones that, as I mentioned, you can get from bone marrow and other cells. They're found in uh, uh, most organs, uh, bone marrow, the gut, we slough off a lot of gut cells over the course of a day, and they need to be regenerated. They're regenerated from stem cells. Skin, same principle. Nervous system has them. Liver, they're rare. So if you do a bone marrow biopsy, only about 1 in 10,000 of those cells are stem cells. And it turns out that stem cells are really boring. They're small. They're nondescript. They're very hard to see. They don't do a lot of things. They just sit there and they ve are easily missed and have been missed for decades. Um, if you put them in the laboratory on a Petri plate, they don't self-renew. That is, they don't keep going and reproducing. Um, and also, they don't have uh, uh, unlimited uh, capacity to differentiate. That is, if you take out a bone marrow cell, you can make it grow to be a, uh, a B a bone marrow cell or blood cells. Um, if you take out uh, the liver, you can get it to be a liver, uh, a more mature liver cell, but you c it's hard to take the liver cell and make it into a bone uh, blood cell. And that's where these induced pluripotent stem cells come in. So just a couple of years ago, Japanese and NIH uh, scientists reprogrammed adult human skin cells to behave like embryonic stem cells. And they did this by injecting them with what are called stem cell associated genes. So basically, scientists have discovered which cell, which genes are critical to reprogramming a cell and to make it look like a stem cell. They packed those genes into a virus, injected the virus into the cell, and those genes then uh, were able to reprogram the skin cell. Um, there's a very important breakthrough. Obviously, it's a little uh, worrisome that you have to use this virus, something called a retrovirus, uh, that can carry DNA that will go back into the uh, uh, nucleus. Um, but they're working on a variety of ways of trying to uh, get the induced pluripotent stem cells without the virus. Um, at the moment, the question is whether these are really just like embryonic stem cells or not. And that is something that uh, we need more testing on. So that's adult uh, stem cells. It's somatic stem cells, another name for them, uh, induced pluripotent cells. And they are different from embryonic stem cells. What's unique about embryonic stem cells? Well, they have two characteristics which make them very uh, important. One is self-renewal. Embryonic stem cells are capable of dividing uh, without differentiating, that is, without becoming more specific, into lots and lots of different cell types. Um, so they can d do this division on and on and on. Then there's pluripotency. Under the right conditions, they can be induced to become any type of cell in the body, a nerve cell, a heart cell, a blood cell, um, skin cell, kidney cell. So these two things. Go, reproducing on and on so they live as long as we live and being able to form into any kind of cell are the two hallmarks of embryonic stem cells. How do you make an embryonic stem cell? Well, there are two processes. The top process is uh, what you might call uh, the old-fashioned way, uh, but not so old. So you take uh, uh, a regular fertilized egg, and that little thing is a fertilized egg, uh, and you grow it up to that blastocyst stage. Remember I mentioned that to you. It's about uh, day five. Uh, it's got a little clump of cells, which will become the embryo and uh, fetus. Uh, and then you take that and you basically break those cells apart and you culture them, and that's how you get stem cells. So that's the more regular way. 
The other way is called somatic cell nuclear transfer. I'm going to mention it now, and I'm going to come back to it in a second. And that is you take a uh, uh, oocyte, you pop out the nucleus, extract it by a pipette, and you put in a nucleus from, say, a skin cell or a uh, uh, bone marrow cell. You grow it up, and you do something to it, and then it develops like a blastocyst, and then you break that apart and culture that. All right, we'll come back to SCNT in a second. Once you've got those cells on a Petri plate, you then have to go through a pretty extensive process that takes almost a year to get what's called stem cell lines on which you can do research and evaluation. This is not a easy process. This is a very labor-intensive and very long process. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of these stages, but a lot of time is spent um, culturing out to make sure that what you have is stem cells and not some other contaminant uh, cell. And you can see this is a lot, you know, this is where a big bulk of the time is involved. But I just put this slide up to make the point that gr creating a stem cell line is a very uh, uh, arduous process. It's not just simply going from the embryo directly to the research material. Now, I said I'd come back to somatic cell nuclear transfer. So somatic cell nuclear transfer, just to decompose the title, is you take the nucleus from a somatic cell, that's where the nuclear comes from, and you transfer it to a woman's egg. So you take, again, from a skin cell, the nucleus that has the DNA, and you put it into uh, a oocyte. Um, and then when you put it in, you can do something to it by chemicals or by electricity to shock it and to make it go back to behave like a regular uh, uh, fertilized egg. And that's uh, how we got DALI. So somatic cell nuclear transfer uh, was done in the uh, early, late 70s, early 80s uh, on frogs. And then when they tried it on mammalians, uh, rats and mice, they got nowhere. And so they thought, eh, it can work in frogs because there are special qualities to their cells, but couldn't work on higher organisms. And one of the reasons Dolly, if you guys remember Dolly in the late 1990s, was such a shock is no one thought it was possible uh, 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 until Wilmer in Scotland uh, basically electrically shocked the uh, cell with the uh, nucleus into uh, reprogramming it and then behaving like a fertilized egg. So right now, we don't know exactly how many stem cell lines there are out there in the world being used. Our best guesstimate um, when I asked the NIH to do this was that there are between six and 700 human embryonic stem cell lines or derivations. And that includes the lines that President Bush said were acceptable for federal funding for research. Now, not only don't we know how many lines, we don't know how many of these lines are viable, good, and their usefulness for scientific research. And part of what I think will evolve over the next uh, few years as more and more people apply for federal funds is we're going to find out which lines are useful for research and which lines aren't and how many are out there that uh, scientists want to use. To put in context, prior to um, uh, the president's executive order uh, about federal funding for st embryonic stem cell research, uh, in fiscal year 2008, uh, about $300 million was spent on non-embryonic stem cell research, so that somatic cell stuff that I talked about, and about $88 million was spent on embryonic uh, stem cell research with the lines that had been approved by President Bush. Now, there's a lot of promise of stem cell research. We haven't had any big breakthroughs yet, uh, uh, certainly not in the uh, area of therapy, uh, but a lot of interest and a, a lot of uh, interesting science has developed. Just to highlight one point that we've learned, uh, the stem cell associated genes, the genes that generate uh, and allow a cell to become a stem cell, that is uh, uh, something that's come out of this uh, research. There are, again, lots of different things that could be important. Uh, identifying drug targets and test potential therapies study how cells go from being undifferentiated, that is, capable of becoming any cell in the body to 
one particular cell. And uh, we might understand a lot about, therefore, uh, birth defects. Uh, but there are a lot, could obviously be lots of therapies for chronic illnesses where the gene defects are key, like Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinsonism, diabetes. So let's now shift from the sort of biology, which is necessary to understand, to the ethics. So I think for most people, the ethical issue is not using a stem cell in research. Once you have the stem cell, it's not unethical to use it and manipulate it, see which genes get turned on and off, uh, which genes might be, or which cells might be therapeutically beneficial to patients with certain illnesses. So I don't think uh, once we've identified and isolated and cultured the stem cell, we have a lot of ethical issues on that part. We have, there are ethical requirements that have to be adhered to, but I don't think it's a big ethical controversy. Um, the ethical controversy really focuses around where stem cells are derived from. So I think the fundamental question is whether it's ethical to create stem cells from embryos, and the concern is whether it's ethical to destroy an embryo while you create the stem cell. A second level question is, is it ethical to use this SCNT or somatic cell nuclear transfer method to get stem cells? So let me remind you of this slide again. So the regular, as it were, process, you take a uh, uh, blastocyst, which has been created, um, and we'll talk about most of these that are going to not, the ones that are going to be acceptable are created through uh, in vitro fertilization. Is that ethical? You end up destroying the embryo here to get the inner cell mass to get the stem cells. Is it a, se a second and separate question, ethical to use somatic cell nuclear transfer to create this blastocyst and then use that? Federal funds uh, cannot be used to create a human embryo for research. To go back to the slide, we cannot create this embryo just for research using federal dollars. That is illegal. Something called the Dickey Wicker Amendment, which gets put on every appropriations bill, makes it illegal to use federal money to create an embryo for research purposes. And that's the provision of the bill. It's been attached to uh, appropriations bills uh, on and on, and uh, there's no likelihood that it's not going to be uh, approved. So creating stem cells, uh, uh, what we have to do is to go to in vitro fertilization facilities and get uh, what some people call spare embryos, but embryos that aren't going to be used for fertility and, and to uh, because either the uh, uh, family has a, uh, decided that they've had enough children, uh, but these were extra embryos created. The ethical issue is that when you create that stem cell, you do destroy the embryo. Um, now, we should recognize that many embryos are already being destroyed. They're embryos that are made for reproduction in in vitro fertilization facilities that aren't needed for reproduction and are no longer being stored. Uh, the last data I could find on this comes from 2002, a study that RAND did, and it went to all the uh, assisted reproductive facilities and surveyed them. Uh, in 2002, there were 400,000 stored embryos, uh, most of which uh, are being stored for family planning purposes uh, to create children. Uh, and again, they might be stored because uh, the couple had one child by IVF and is waiting to have another, or they had some and uh, are storing them and uncertain what they're going to do. Uh, a small number uh, are being stored because they're being donated to other uh, couples who themselves can't uh, actually uh, donate an egg or a sperm. Uh, 11,000 are uh, designated for research, and most of this is for, for fertility research, not stem cell research. And about each year, uh, 8,800 in 2002 each year are destroyed because the family has decided that they've done, they're done with reproduction and they're uh, uh, not going to pay for, for they're not going to use them again and not pay for further storage. It is these at the bottom, which are the potential ones for uh, that are already being destroyed and and could be used for research purposes. Um, 
Of the, as I mentioned here, of the 11,000 that are currently being used for research, uh, the RAND people estimated that very few were really suitable for stem cell research for a whole variety of reasons. So the ethical question is, should we destroy embryos without any further use, or should we use the embryos that are going to be destroyed uh, in some way? And I put use in quotations because I think uh, it has uh, sort of uh, unpleasant connotations. Um, most ethical analyses, uh, but not all, would suggest that using the embryos for some socially useful purpose, such as scientific research and potential clinical therapies, as in stem cell research, is better than simply destroying the embryos with no socially beneficial product afterwards. And that, I think, is the fundamental ethical uh, issue. Uh, it was on the basis of, I think, that analysis that uh, President Obama, when he came into office, signed an executive order to change federal funding for stem cell, embryonic stem cell research. And what the, fed, what the executive order said is that stem cells can obtain federal funding only if the embryo from which the stem cells were derived were donated under the following conditions. So let me just back up and reemphasize a point. You can't use federal money to create a stem cell for, uh, to create an embryo f to derive the stem cell from, but you can use federal funds once the stem cell is created. And the president's executive order said that process, creating the stem cell line, had to be done under a certain way for it to be ethical and for it to be uh, acceptable to fund it. Uh, it had, this uh, embryo had to be created by in vitro fertilization or reproduction and not needed for reproduction. So again, the family decided that they were comp finished with reproduction. It had to be donated by the person who sought reproductive treatment and gave voluntary consent for the embryo to be used by research, uh, in research. The consent uh, forms had to include information assuring the following things, that the embryo was not needed for reproduction, that there was no payment for taking the embryo and using it in research, uh, that they didn't give the embryo, uh, that not giving the embryo for uh, stem cell research wouldn't change the quality of care that the woman and couple were receiving, that there was a separation between the decision to create the embryo for reproduction and the donation for research. They didn't want this, we don't want this process used surreptitiously. The donor also understands that the embryo will, will be used for research and, and this is the executive order, what would happen to the embryo in the derivation of the stem cells, basically, that it would be destroyed. The donor will not make any money, even if the stem cell turns out to be extremely valuable, and research will not provide any direct medical benefit to the donor herself. Um, I should tell you that we think, although we're not 100% sure, that the executive order will probably mean that some of the stem cell lines approved by President Bush will not be eligible for federal funding because they didn't fulfill those requirements. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is, is surrounding the consent requirements that weren't, uh, 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 requ weren't necessarily fulfilled prior to the donation. Regarding somatic stem cells, again, these are the adult stem cells, not the embryonic stem cells. They're governed by existing regulations because they're human tissue, and we have existing research regulations that govern them, so nothing special had to be put in place by the executive order. And that's also one reason why uh, a lot more funding had gone to these uh, adult stem cells uh, before. So I just want to emphasize now, in my final remarks, something about this process here, the uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer. I said, and I uh, uh, mentioned that it's a more controversial. And again, to remind you, the process is you take an egg, a woman's oocyte, you pop out that nucleus, and then you find another nucleus from an adult cell, skin cell or liver cell or bone marrow cell, and you inject it in, and that, and then you chemically or electrically do something to get it to grow as an embryo. Now, um, the use of stem cells from SCNT is controversial. They're valuable for science, but it's a form of cloning because that embryo will have the exact same genetics of the person from whom the nucleus was taken, the exact same genes. Uh, it can be characterized as using a stem cell from an embryo created only for research 
and being destroyed in the process of research. And some feminists object because the need to retrieve the eggs from women uh, suggests uh, uh, the specter of exploitation. In the other case, the eggs were removed from women for the purposes of their reproductive choices. Here, you're removing the eggs only for research. Um, now, the somatic cell nuclear transfer, as I mentioned, is a type of cloning, but it's not cloning that's reproductive cloning. It's not trying to make a person because in the end what you're trying to do is get the stem cells. So it's not reproductive cloning. There's widespread agreement in our society that reproductive cloning is not ethical. Um, and uh, that's not to say everyone agrees to it, but the vast majority of Americans agree to it. There is much more controversy around therapeutic cloning and whether doing somatic cell nuclear transfer, uh, which is this type of cloning, is ethical. Current policy, including in the executive order by President uh, Obama, is to prohibit federal funding of stem cell research created by uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer. Um, and part of the rationale is that there is a lot of controversy about it and society is not settled on this uh, and not settled on the fact whether this is ethical or not ethical. And I think it's to give us time to discuss the issue and think it through a little more. Um, I think I'm going to pass on this to give us more time for question and answer. I hope that was useful to give us a background for the rest of the discussion. Two seats oh, here. Two seats. All right. I'll grab my bubble in. Let me. Um, so we will go. We'll, we will go right to audience questions. The only thing I do want to say is, um, in my uh, rush to give Oxford all the credit for giving you so many degrees, <laughs> and you're getting degrees from all over the place, I forgot to say you have a PhD in political science from Harvard and a medical doctorate from Harvard as well. Right. So I didn't want to underestimate all the degrees you have in the place. It's a lot of wasted money, actually. Right, right. Well, uh, not totally <laughs> wasted. Why don't we open it up? And uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you can just shout into that microphone. <laughs> Uh, Zeke, you've had your position in the previous administration and in the current administration. Can you characterize a little bit uh, the, the comfort or discomfort with uh, present that present researchers have with the way that the policy has changed? How much did the, did the needle actually move um, under Obama? Uh, well, it's a good question. I think there is some pushback. Uh, I'll be frank about it. There's been some pushback about the consent requirements. And so in, I didn't go into detail in this, but in the, uh, I, I think scientists in both cases were upset, um, uh, both in President Bush's for creating a line and in uh, a certain date and stem cells before uh, were acceptable, but stem cells after weren't. Um, I think with the original uh, uh, policy, there was some worry that existing stem cells, those 700 existing human stem cells, many of them wouldn't comply. After all, the requirements that had been laid out in the executive order were not uh, in place before, hadn't been articulated before when people were trying to derive stem cells. And so people were doing it, I wouldn't say exactly in a vacuum, because the National Academy of Science had made some suggestions, the European had some suggestions, the societies for uh, uh, research in stem cells had made suggestions about the ethical manner. I will say none of them have gone as far as President Obama's requ ethical requirements for consent and procedural requirements to make sure that this is, uh, uh, as, uh, in the President's words, uh, we want it to fulfill a higher bar. If we're going to do stem cell research, he specifically said it has to pass a higher bar um, and so part of what we have built into the actual operations, I should say we, the NIH built into the actual operations, and I was not part of that committee that drafted the, the guidance, uh, is um, two paths to getting approval for existing stem cells. Either they could say they fulfilled all the consent requirements that we laid out, or that their process was functionally equivalent, ethically equivalent, and they'll have to provide um, evidence that the consent was separate in time, that it was donated for reproduction, et cetera, even if the consent that was signed was not exactly the same. What is the process for revising 
this whole thing year by year as people come up with different objections? Uh, well, let's hope they don't come up with too many objections. <laughs> uh, but there, yeah, there is a process for the NIH to re-examine the, uh, the uh, guidelines that they've issued for what's, uh, uh, which stem cells are permissible. Um, I think actually what you're going to, I mean, one of the things that we've tried to do is that a stem cell has to be approved, a stem cell line has to be approved only once. Then it'll go on a website and any researcher anywhere can just cite the fact that it's been approved so it won't require multiple uh, uh, reviews of the exact same thing over and over, a waste of time, a waste of resources, and uh, probable delay in, in research. So part of what the NIH has tried to do is to make this a very efficient process, one ethical review. Uh, and uh, then anyone can use that same stem cell line knowing that it's been approved for federal funding. To what extent should those lines be in the public domain and to what extent can they be privately owned? Uh, there's no requirement in this about them uh, being private, that they can't be privately owned. Many of these stem cell lines have been created by private companies um, or have been created by uh, uh, academic researchers who then spin off uh, companies. And so but well, no what are the ethical issues there for you? Well, I, I mean, the, the issue is, I, I think the bigger issue is whether they're going to be used for social benefits. And uh, uh, a lot of this is a shot in the dark. Uh, you know, that's why it's called research and not engineering. Um, and how, how uh, beneficial in the end these are going to be, I think, is still uh, an open question. They've got a lot of promise, and it may turn out that their most interesting things turn out not to be uh, necessarily therapeutically beneficial, but telling us about development and telling us how cells develop, and that might lead to products. I mean, you just can't tell at this point. Mm -hmm. Michael Klein. <laughs> Hello, Michael. <laughs> in light of the uh, societal interest in this subject, what's the rationale for delegating the consent to the individual mother, to the female? Well, she, uh, I, I am not an expert in that particular issue, but uh, she, the, the mother and the couple are actually the people who control the, uh, they own the, uh, the uh, embryo. And uh, that's the issue. We don't want to just take away their embryo uh, and, co I mean, basically be coercive. Uh, that's not a, uh, uh, the usual thing we do, uh, except under special circumstances. I mean, but Michael, you're sort of suggesting that these embryos could be used without the consent of the person who created the embryo? Yeah. It strikes me as a huge societal issue with a lot of overwhelming moral and religious debate, and it ends up being, given the spectrum of people in the society, it ends up being decided. The control over the access to this scientific material turns out to be pretty idiosyncratic and individualistic. Mm -hmm. I understand the answer. I just, right. it was probably. Lots of things in our society are idiosyncratic and individualistic. Well, uh, that's one of the great things about America, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Um, on uh, one of your slides, you showed a breakdown of what happens to the various uh, embryonic cells. X amount are used for reproduction and are stored. Oh, those are stored embryos. Right. Not, stored, not, yeah, not. I'm sorry, stored embryos. Yeah. And, and then one of the larger numbers uh, was other. And all the other categories were like 2.4, 2.1. And then other was four point something. So I just have a question, A, what's the other? Mm -hmm. And then B, on you said there were some embryos that are designated for research, and you said, well, they're designated for fertility research. And what is the moral differentiation of taking these embryos for, for fertility research? What happened? Are they then destroyed versus using them for any other type of research? That's a, that's a superb question, and I think uh, a lot of them have other kinds of defects that make them inappropriate for implantation, and they wouldn't develop. Um, and a lot of the research is to try to understand those processes. Um, but I, that's a, not an unreasonable question. And again, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, this whole area is fraught with controversy. And I, again, you don't want to, or I'll speak for myself, I, I, would, I would think it would be a bad thing for us to treat the embryo as if it were somehow the same as just skin cells. It's obviously got special significance because in the normal course of advance, it will, uh, um, not 100% of the time, and actually in most bodies probably, you know, just about 50% of the time capable of developing into uh, a uh, baby. So there's something special about it. But that is clearly mostly potential and not actual. 
um, and there's lots of things that go wrong along the process. So we want to treat it in a very uh, special manner and not treat it cavalierly. And I think part of what our society is having difficulty about, and it's not surprising, is what does that mean? What does it t mean to treat it with respect and dignity, but not in the same way as we treat babies and, full, and, and adults and people like that? And I think we're trying to understand, as a, collect as a society, trying to understand that. Okay, right there, and I'll call on some people afterwards. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I wonder what your I views... Thought, I think that's why they put me in this chair. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wonder what your views are about the potential appointment of Francis Collins as the new director of NIH, uh, given uh, his evangelical views and what that might do to future research in brain, st brain uh, stem cell research. I think Fr Francis is a brilliant scientist who's done path-breaking work, especially on cystic fibrosis. He's overseen the Human Genome Project, and he clearly has strong views about uh, uh, his own religious faith. And I think he's been one of those great scientists that has been able to do wonderful public service uh, and recognizes the differentiation between public positions and private positions. I think anyone who's served in the government uh, and has uh, in any way participated in major policy decisions understands very clearly that there is a difference. That isn't to say your personal views don't shape. That isn't to say you don't make arguments from uh, uh, that cite uh, or, or sometimes invoke your personal opinions. But it is also the idea that at the end of the day, when the policy process runs its course, you are there to implement your, uh, the, the policy that's decided. Almost all of us, as I say, who've been involved in those decisions end up having to not have our views necessarily implemented every time. And you know, I think that we recognize how to live with that, and it, I don't think it's a compromise of personal integrity. It's part of serving a government where you are in service of the government. And you know, the great thing about America is he still has the right to express his own personal opinion and uh, to write books about his own personal opinion, and that's the way it should be. And let's face it, there are many, many other people in positions of authority in the government who have very strong religious views on lots of things, whether they're Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Muslims, uh, and you know they should be in those positions and the same standard should abide by. And I'm 100% sure, having worked with Francis for uh, 12 years, I guess, at, when we were both at the NIH, uh, he's been tremendously supportive of very uh, good uh, obviously world-class science, but also world-class ethical considerations uh, on these issues. And there's never in my dealings with him been any taint of his religious views have to win out or dominate. So I think it'll be fantastic, and I look forward to working with him. Um, just so everybody knows, Francis Collins wrote, what was the name of his book about science and God? And the, it was a great we book. we got a publisher here. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. But it's... I mean, just hearing the question and your answer, it's somewhat odd in a way that we would question having somebody with religious views do something, yeah. but you wouldn't question an ardent atheist from doing something. Don't you think he was perhaps appointed because his religious views added something to the mix of discussion of the ethical issues? Well, it is true that in American history, right, we had, it used to be that we had big discussions about having an atheist in the White House, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, wasn't the big attack on Jefferson about him being an atheist in the White House, uh, and he clearly was a deist, not an atheist. But I mean, it, that issue of the mix between religion and public service has been with us uh, forever in this country. I would say that, uh, again, you know, as far as uh, Francis goes, uh, he has been a wonderful public service. I do not, I don't, wasn't privy to the, to the. Uh, uh, decision-making process about his appointment, but uh, uh, take away the religion and you've got a uh, highly talented scientist who's made great scientific contributions, shown he can run a very important scientific enterprise, and you know he certainly has to be on the short list of anybody right. who r religious views or no religious views. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry, right there. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, Just trying to... Yeah. Zeke, if I can... Trying to get a woman. speak on this in light of your new exalted position. Um, I'd be interested... You obviously have not seen my office with no 
full <laughs> ceil and full walls. Right. Well, um, <laughs> you you don't have pipes. That's because we don't want health. We definitely have pipes. Yeah, that's right. right. We um, want it to be done in cubicles where people can listen in. It's a three-part question. Can you describe, summarize your view of, if you will, fixing health care? No. Why? <laughs> why the White House has decided not to pursue it? No. <laughs> and what is and what is likely to happen on the Hill, in your view? <laughs> no to all three. Uh, uh, to start with the last one, uh, um, I am not a political uh, expert, and I think, as Bob Rubin once said, I am not certified to comment on political issues. I have a relative, and you can ask him that question. He's much smarter on this issue than I am, I assure you. Uh, he constantly reminds me of my political uh, ineptitude. Um, so, next question. Okay. Uh, yes, sir, right here. Sorry. Yeah. How is uh, stem cell research handled in Europe? Well, it's a great question. Different in all different countries. So in Germany, very, very uh, limited amount of research. And ironically there, they get most of their uh, embryos for stem cell research from Israel. Uh, Go figure. Well, I'll explain. Let, let me explain why. Um, in uh, uh, Germany, you're not allowed to make uh, extra embryos the way we have made it in the United States. So they do not have 400,000 or 200,000 or 50,000 stored embryos the way we have. Uh, and so they have regulated the reproductive uh, area much more carefully. In Israel, uh, uh, given the religious proclivities, uh, using science for reproduction is highly encouraged. Um, and uh, uh, doing anything to save a life is also highly encouraged. And so you have this uh, confluence of uh, uh, cultural and ethical uh, perspectives that uh, encourages uh, stem cell research. Um, uh, conversely, to compare Britain uh, to uh, Germany, uh, I don't want to say more loosely because the British have had extensive national discussions about stem cell research, but there's a much more uh, social uh, coherence and agreement uh, on going forward, uh, pretty full blast about stem cell research. So it, uh, a lot of this depends upon the co country's uh, uh, ethical judgments. I will say, um, from my own perspective, one of the things we can learn from the British and German experience is the importance of having a robust public discussion about these things. Um, I think that uh, there's, as I hopefully have mentioned, there are some areas in our country where I think we do have widespread agreement. Uh, I think we have widespread agreement about uh, um, cloning for reproduction. No. I think we have widespread, uh, uh, but again, but not unanimous agreement uh, about uh, supporting President Obama's uh, executive order to permit federal funding for stem cells that are created in this uh, very ethical manner with full consent and knowledge. Um, but as I mentioned, we don't have, I think, full social consent, consensus on uh, SCNT or somatic cell nuclear transfer and therapeutic cloning. And I think part of what we need to do as a society is to take and to be very careful to differentiate these issues and have a more robust public debate about this uh, so that we can come to a, uh, again, not unanimity, but social consensus as to whether it's appropriate or not appropriate. And then the funding should follow. And I think uh, Britain has uh, uh, done that they actually have some very, very uh, good mechanisms uh, for doing that. So, why is it philosophically that we think it's immoral to have cloning for reproductive purposes? And can you imagine some society elsewhere in the world that would have a different moral view of that? Um, I, no. Uh, I mean, I guess. Theoretically, can you imagine another? Uh, yes, I guess you can imagine. I don't think so. And I think part of the issue about uh, reproductive cloning goes back to trying to understand the motivation for any particular instance of reproductive cloning. And almost all the ones that you can think of turn out to be incredibly narcissistic and incredibly uh, uh, just about the person and not about the being that you would create. And so I think in general, uh, there's a, not so a really... So it's using a 
another individual for your own ends, which yeah. is the fundamental right. moral I, I, sin yeah, throughout I, history. Yeah, I, I, again, it's to create someone in your own image or something like that or in some other image. And I think there's a lot of uh, uh, appropriate uh, 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 hesitation uh, to endorse that and to permit it. Um, so I think that's underlying the unease uh, uh, around uh, reproductive cloning. Yes, and again, I, I, it, I think you know, there's probably, you know, maybe there's something biologic about that repulsion to it. But the fact is, there's not, you, again, not unanimity, but pretty widespread social uh, negativity to it. Although it's not illegal, it hasn't been, Congress never well, passed Well, I was going to follow up and uh, say that somebody could just uh, do it, right? Uh, I don't want to say that, but there ha we haven't made it illegal in this country, and that's been a, a sort of political stalemate. Is there a, a point in the, uh, the slide on fetal development where you believe that the, uh, the embryo, the zygote, is a bearer of, uh, of rights, of moral rights, in your own personal view? Is there, and, and not just is what there. What does my view ma matter in this? Uh, I mean, you are, well, it does matter. You are very well trained in this. It's a very good question. Which yeah. is, when do rights start accruing? Yes, and, and I'm interested not just in your conclusion, but in how you derive it. Uh, do you follow consequentialist arguments or essentialist arguments? The uh, bioethicist Paul you don't, have to, you don't have to follow either of them. I, I, and I wouldn't, I, I don't know, I, I feel uncomfortable following either uh, completely consequentialist arguments because those arguments are... Uh, don't put a good barrier over, you know, using you to save five people by harvesting both kidneys, your heart, your liver, and on and on. Um, and I don't buy the essentialist argument that somehow the, you know, this uh, one cell organism is ensouled um, and uh, uh, es essential being. Um, I do, and again, this is a completely personal view, should not be taken as public uh, policy or even my informing public policy. I do think that uh, uh, we have a gradation uh, uh, over time. I don't think there's a bright line, and I think the effort to find a bright line is mostly because we need policies on one side. It's okay to do X, and policies on the other side, it's not okay to do X. So I don't find, and I, I think from an ethical standpoint, I don't find that very persuasive. So some of the lines that have been used uh, that might have some uh, persuasive power. When does an embryo feel, or a fetus feel pain? Um, it turns out pretty late in the process uh, because you need all sorts of neurological hookups which are pretty late in the development process. One of the reasons a, a woman carries a baby for nine months is that it takes a long time for all the nerve connections to hook up. Uh, on the other hand, you might say, well, maybe what we want is the differentiation, the capacity to form neural connections and higher consciousness and not wait for the full formation, and that would be earlier on. And that actually happens remarkably early, uh, uh, between 14 and 28 days, you get uh, differentiation. Um, so I don't like either line, personally, but I do think somewhere ac across the line, uh, across, uh, you, we have to think of a continuum uh, of development. And I think, at least, again, in the ethical, in the policy arena, you might have to draw a bright line, which will be somewhat arbitrary. But I think in the policy arena, um, in the ethical arena, when we're really thinking about it, we do think that there's more of a continuum than a, you know, uh, bright line. We, me, okay, not a policy statement that is a personal uh, ethical statement. So uh, not connecting it to the abortion debate, but if you were to find that growing cells later and later allowed you better therapeutic things, you would say the later it gets, the more morally problematic uh, it is. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah. I, I think I got to correct yeah. the biology here. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, embryo, uh, the embryo growing later and later before you extract Yeah, no, no, that's not going to be the case. Okay. Actually, it, we want it, the embryo earlier and earlier um, because what you want, remember, is the pluripotent cells, the cells that can differentiate into anything. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to wait till 14 days, because at 14 days you now have differentiation of nerve cells from other cells, that would be, that would, they, they would no longer be stem cells. So the eight day, nine day uh, blastocyst stage, or the five day blastocyst stage is, that's why they picked that stage, because you have a, a, a large number of pluripotent cells. Yes, ma'am. 
Thank you. I have three questions. So you know what I did to the last set of three questions. <laughs> I'll try and be brief in my questions, and if you can address each one, I'd, that'd be fantastic. Uh, number one, could you speak on Geron, and are you versed in that? Um, no. And, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Going down the same path as Mr. Silverman. Okay, All right. Because uh, they are conducting clinical trials. Number two, how far off do you foresee the United States being in conducting clinical trials, given the FDA and their conservative viewpoint and governmental restrictions. And number three, this is a little more complex, and you may choose to go there or not, uh, is at what stage of the embryo's development does it acquire an antigenic protein that would then cause an immune reaction in the body if the human embryonic stem cell that is harvested is indeed a pure human product that doesn't have a mouse fetus cell injected in it. And so... I'm not sure I understand that question. So the question is, well, let me just simplify it. At what point of the embryo's development does it acquire an antigenic protein? And if it's... I mean, the, look, it's got antigenic proteins early on. One of the ways we identify... At the five-day blastocyst stage? Uh, that I'm not... Uh, but it has to have early on because that's how it, the cells migrate, know what's nearby, know which ones are, are differentiated. I mean, I, I, the, the question is, when is it going to be rejected by other... Uh, if you implant it? Yes, with transplantation. If it hasn't yet acquired that embryos at but, the but stage... That, well, then it, um, should there not be an immune reaction in the body? Uh, I am not an expert, and I'm not therefore going to comment about the uh, development of antigens that are uh, unique uh, and uh, might create an uh, immune response. But we do know that... Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. there. There's other things to reason that that's not going to be the problem. Um, I'm not going to answer the first question about Geron. I will say something about the FDA. I think, you know, everyone talks about the FDA being conservative. Let's be a little sympathetic for a second and suspend. The FDA is in a uh, very difficult place. Um, and I don't uh, envy one iota the FDA commissioner or the organization. On the one hand, we want them to protect us from bad things whether it's bad food products, tainted food products, uh, drugs that might cause bad side effects, uh, procedures, uh, experimental procedures that might cause bad things to happen. On the other hand, we also want innovation, and we want them to uh, facilitate innovation. That's a very difficult balancing act, because every innovation has uncertainties, and you have to weigh how much uncertainty in causing harm are you, gonna, are you willing to tolerate. And they're constantly doing this battle. Do they get it right? Well, you know, with retrospect, we can always say they got it wrong. Uh, in prospect, I think it's hard to make those evaluations. And I think they do go from more conservative, ba probably based upon the most recent experience, to less conservative based upon a good. Um, I think it's a pretty tough job to do under the best of circumstances. Second, they have been an agency that has uh, probably not received enough resources for the demands that they do. Their, uh, last time I saw statistics, something more more than a third of the economy they had oversight over. Food, drugs, cosmetics, yada. I mean, and they're like a $2 billion agency. You know, the, the money doesn't seem to match what we're asking them to do. Uh, so I think uh, one needs to be sympathetic to them and not just critical of, in this case, I didn't like this. Well, in this case, you might not have liked it, but that standard that they've adopted there, that may be because... We need that standard in other areas to protect the population from, say, a drug that causes really bad side effects or, you know, God forbid, something like thalidomide coming out. So, you know, I think it's a very tough balancing act, and they're constantly having to do this balancing act. And I think it's very easy for a critic to say, ah, they got it wrong. I think it's much harder to say, if I were in their shoes, how might I have thought about this differently? Um, yes, ma'am, right there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the mic is running around to you. 
I'm sorry. I'm making the poor, yeah. Thank you. I'd like you to comment on the situation in Japan where they had all the problems. I think you mean Korea. Yes, Korea. Yeah. with Korea, I'm sorry. Well, it's a, a, Korea is actually um, a prototypical case. So Korea is a, is a situation where um, there was a lot of social pressure to have stem cell breakthroughs because Korea is, uh, it's an amazing story for those of you who know, you know, after World War II and the Korean War, completely impoverished country, it's made unbelievable strides to uh, uh, move up uh, into the developed uh, country. And their next big step has been to try to become developed in all the other ways, not just, you know, GDP per person, but Sci become a real scientific powerhouse, um, uh, and there had been a lot of social pressure. And one researcher, uh, in the end, completely fabricated that he was able to, to create human stem cells. In the process of doing that, it's become apparent, and, and by the way, I should say that bioethicists in Korea that I know have been, were sort of alarmed by his activities well before they were revealed. And there was, again, a lot of social pressure to quiet that up. Uh, but part of the problem, and again, part of the rationale, I think, behind President Obama's uh, executive order and the important consent requirements is that uh, it n seems pretty clear that many of the women who were uh, donating uh, oocytes for the research were coerced uh, into the donation. Um, and uh, uh, at, uh, they worked in the laboratory or had other uh, pressures brought to bear on them, and you know that is a problem. And uh, you know we're, uh, I, I think the administration is hoping that the uh, guidelines issued by the NIH to have these very stringent consent requirements is an effort to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's what, yeah in the back there. In the, yeah, sorry. Can you pass the mic down? And yes, I'm trying to get. I was curious as to. Um, how long it'll be before we see organ replacement? And the second part of the question is, if if did I come here to talk about stem cells? If it, yeah. we got if, healthcare reform, organ replacement. If, if it's if it's say twenty well, years away, will we if we wanted to speed it up by half, how much more money would we have uh, to spend? You know, some of this is money, but I think I'm not sure that a lot of it's money. I mean, these th are things which require breakthroughs, and breakthroughs is only money, partially money dependent, partially it's science dependent, um, in the sense that. You know, you need an insight or you need a development in some other area. Um, and I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, money would be import is important. I have no idea in the case of organ uh, replacement. That's not my area. Um, but I think uh, one needs to understand that uh, this isn't just money. And let me give you an example closer to home that I can actually talk more intelligently about. Uh, in 1972, President Nixon declared a war on cancer, and there wasn't a shortage of money. That war on cancer got a lot, a lot of money. We have a lot of researchers on cancer. Uh, it stimulated the world, not just the United States, to do research. You know, 550,000 people still die of cancer. Uh, we don't have a lot of cures for a lot of cancers. Uh, we have made breakthroughs. I don't want to minimize the breakthroughs we've had in testicular cancer and Hodgkin's disease and chronic myelogenous leukemia. But there are a lot of cancers for which lung cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, we just don't have that much. Uh, and it's not for a lack of money. We understand a huge amount, much more than we could have in 1972, about what goes wrong in creating a cancer cell, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but we couldn't understand a lot of that until other progress was made, progress about understanding how genes work, progress on understanding differentiation, you know, tumor suppressor genes, et cetera. So it's not just money. It's a lot of it is additional insights, progress in other areas that you might not have originally thought were related to cancer, et cetera. So the idea that we could buy a cure or buy a therapy, I think, is uh, very simplistic and, and, in general, wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not to say. We shouldn't be supporting biomedical research, and, it, and supporting it is going to, you know, have lots of important uh, uh, side uh, consequences. Um, but it is, uh, we need to be, I think, a little more sober about the fact that uh, 
Dollar in does not mean cure out. Uh, That's what, again, let me go back to a statement I made before. That's why it's called science and not engineering. Last question, Ms. Marjoram. <laughs> and then. Uh, you have written a book about uh, living wills. Uh, do you think. No, I actually haven't written a book. I've, I've written a living will, but I haven't written a book about it. Well, what was that? <laughs> Oh. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to still ask a question. Yeah, you can it. still ask the question. Absolutely. Do you feel that there's general understanding in this country of a living will and the positive nature of it? Uh, when I got into this field, I started working in end of life care in 1984. And I was kindly advised by the chairman of medicine at that time that that was a death sentence to me. Uh, because no one in the medical profession was interested in end-of-life care, and if I went off and did that, um, I would soon not have a career. Uh, I will say it was certainly very difficult to get funding in the 80s for research. Uh, things are completely different now, and I can just give you some of the landmarks of the differences. Uh, I don't know, way back in the 84 when I started, um, probably less than 10% of the population had a living will. We're now over 30%. We're still not at 90%, which is where we ought to be. And there are places in the country that have gotten to 90%, uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin being uh, a, a, an example. Uh, we, almost no one uh, was using hospice way back when, in the 80s. Uh, now, uh, more than half of uh, 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 cancer patients and probably between 35 and 45% of uh, uh, people who are on Medicare have hospice uh, at the end of life. Uh, when I started out being trained as an oncologist, uh, we had none, no training, zero, on end of life care and what to do. And I will just give you one of my own personal horror stories. Uh, and this is, um, no one told me, you know, when one of your patients dies, you should write a note to the family saying what a great person, how much you enjoyed taking care of them, what and express your condolences. You know, it took four or five terrible mistakes of mine before I realized it on my own. Uh, in 1997, the American Society of Clinical Oncology devoted its um, annual meeting to uh, improving end-of-life care. At that time, almost like we flipped the switch, every cancer center began developing, having a palliative care team, much more interventions. Can I say that, you know, end-of-life care among cancer patients is, is Perfect, no, but a lot better training, a lot more focus on it. Um, is there a large way to go? Yes, we still have lots of things we can do. Too many patients still die in hospitals on machines when they don't want to. Uh, we can still improve the palliative care services. Uh, I think the main benefit of, a li of living wills is, is that they provoke a discussion uh, and that they do give guidance to doctors and to families. Um, and I think uh, we know that when a uh, medical center and uh, the surrounding uh, community wants to focus in on this, they can do tremendous things. They can really make that uh, tragic dying process much better for the family, for the uh, uh, patient. Um, and I think we just need a lot more of that. But I do think we're on the right trajectory uh, and uh, um, I think there's probably more acceptance and openness in our society, certainly than in 1984 when I uh, started that uh, process. Uh, you won't go to any cancer center in America anymore and them sort of pretending like their patients never die. Uh, it just, just doesn't happen. Um, and so I think uh, uh, we have, it, the world has changed in that area, but um, of course there's a lot more we can do and I'm sure over the next decade, things will improve. I know you couldn't. Uh, thank you. I, I want to end with one general question coming out of stem cells. And I know it's my fault in a way when people were trying to ask about uh, health care reform. Zeke said, I can't come out here now. We're in the middle of health care reform, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. And I said, well, come on out here, and we'll talk about stem cells. So it's not his fault that he can't do it. The, uh, it's his brother's fault. Um, <laughs> Just but, another sign of how little he trusts me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I would like to ask you in a general way, coming out, if we're successful, with stem cell research, with this 
new blossoming, I hope we have, based on the Obama mm -hmm. opening up. How will that affect medicine in our society and health care, and health, the cost of health care in our society? So um, most of us who've looked at health care uh, in the United States thinks that, think that we could do a lot better now. Uh, we spend 16% of GDP. The next closest country, uh, it's either Norway or Switzerland, they've been bouncing back and forth, uh, spends 50% less than we do. Uh, we are way off the curve. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of waste that we can reclaim uh, and not affect the quality of care or people's choices or people's access to various things. Uh, the real trick is how do you get rid of the waste and keep the important thing and, and keep quality up. Uh, and again, uh, the president uh, has uh, talked about this and certainly the person I work for, Peter Orzag, uh, we've developed a lot of proposals. The House bill and the Senate proposed bills have a lot of these uh, changes that will make the system more efficient and higher quality. Um, if we got ourselves down and was able, were able to save that uh, money, which may be as much as $500 billion a year, just to put it in context, uh, no trivial amount. Uh, there's more than enough to take in and pay for uh, important advances. And one of the other things, one of the problems we've had in our system is that there's very little incentive to develop an important advance that's cost effective. Uh, or to figure out when you have an advance, how can I make it more cost effective? Just it's the financial reimbursement structure we've created. If I've got an advance, you know, I can charge the moon for it. And sometimes, if I don't have an advance, I can also charge the moon for it, uh, if people believe enough. Um, so I think that stem cells may initially, if, if they work, may initially be expensive. But I think you will, we will figure out uh, different ways to make them much more affordable uh, and much more mass produced. Uh, I don't think that uh, getting a therapy one person at a time is likely to be uh, the way we're going to, stem cells are eventually going to work. And I think we're going to figure out something that we can treat, I mean, lots of people. It would be impossible, say, if we had a breakthrough with stem cells related to Alzheimer's to treat 5 million people deriving cells from each person one at a time. You just mm -hmm. forget the money. You just don't have the manpower, the skilled manpower and you couldn't develop that overnight. It would take decades. So that's not going to be the solution, one stem cell per person. Um, so I think we would figure out how is that stem cell working, and then what the biological mechanism, and then you're going to either develop a, biological a different biological therapy that can be mass produced or a pill or something. So that, if you ask me to sort of predict the future, and you know, you know what my predictions of the future are worth? Zero. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you very much, Vic. That was very good.